So let, let, let's go okay. back because I, I'm, I, I want you to imagine we're talking to the little kid who's only got to understand East Coast, West Coast issues from the point of some type of white journalist explaining it. Okay. So let's do it like this. Years 1992, there's a guy named Supercat. And on Supercat had he Supercat had a remix to a song called Dolly My Baby. And on that song, this guy who um admittedly would not be considered an aesthetically attractive guy by any far stretch of the imagination, no diddy. And he says, I love it when you call me Big Papa. Whoa, like, whoa. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Hold on. Go ahead. That's where the sample for Big Papa comes from. That's an actual sample of Supercat's Dolly My Baby of Biggie when he was on Uptown rapping. But he came with such fire, you can't remember anything other than, I love it when you call me Big Papa. I only go. The way Big did things. Then, when that first record dropped and it's M2 Maze Juicy, yeah, this album is dedicated to all the people who told me I'll never amount to nothing. To all, the, to all the bums that try to call the police on me when I was just trying to make money to feed my daughter. To all the people in the struggle. You know what I'm saying? It's all good, baby, baby. He was rapping over R&B the same way Mary J was singing over rap beats. Mm. In a way that had not been done. Yes, Public Enemy had sampled stuff. D Dolomite had been sampled. And a bunch of people had sampled. But nobody was doing gutter rap. Gutter Dirty bed -sty rap to smooth ass beats and lyrically destroying anybody in the industry. He became the standard bearer damn near overnight. Mm. No diss to Rakim or Big Daddy Kane, but I'm speaking about linchpin moments in hip hop history. And then he just kept following it up, right? And then you probably never heard this, but there was a record. In 95, the original One More Chance was like, burn, 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 burn. and it just had these women go, as we proceed to give you what you need. It was like everything he touched was just like, and then when that one, what you, one more chance, the one where you see all the, the Miss Jones and Aaliyah and Mary, everybody who was anybody in this video in a brownstone just vibing out like, that's what he was. And then on top of that, he understood how to talk to the DJs because this man was slinging. Mm. You know what I mean? He, he had certain negotiation skills and he had, he was funny. He was a funny, like he had jokes on top of jokes on top of jokes. And he didn't take himself seriously. He was so happy. Right? But he wasn't somebody you played with. You understand? He knew everything and he was so self-deprecating black and ugly as ever however i stay gucci dial to the socks mm. rings and watch filled with rocks and my jam knock in your mitsubishi like you have to understand that he did everything and he only had one mission and that mission was to be the greatest and then you go back and you listen to all of those features jesus the notorious just mm. please us what you look he was different he wasn't heavy D because he wasn't doing that medilly dilly dilly. He wasn't dancing or none of that. He was just, oh. And it worked because he had the streets and he had the sheets mm. in a way that nobody else did. So the same way Jesus, and I'm not comparing, but I'm trying to give you something that everybody can relate to. The same way Jesus looked at Peter and said, on that rock, I will build my church on the back of Biggie, Puff built bad boy. Period. So, so if it wasn't for if Puffy never came in, would Biggie have had a longer career besides I believe he only dropped one album, Life After Death? He dropped two albums. He dropped Ready to Die and he dropped Life After Death. The other thing about Big is when Big was working, he worked. When he wasn't, he wasn't. That's why Tupac got like 17 albums. He got albums that you ain't even heard. Mm -hmm. Because he worked like that. Like he Pac was a different type of Biggie wasn't on that. All right, so I'll go to the movies. Just that's how he was, you know what I'm saying? But I think that wherever you put big, he was going to succeed. But I also know, and I have it on good authority from several people that I know who do not know that I know all individuals involved who have also said that he was trying to get away from Puff. Oh, wow! And on top of that, 
Um, he wasn't even supposed to be in LA. He was supposed to be in London, but you know, he had that situation with his leg. He had gained some more weight. He didn't want to make that, he didn't want to make that long trip because he was about to face some charges. I don't remember what the charges were because you asked me to go back years ago, but the thing of it is, I think everybody started getting hit to what was happening. What was happening? You know? I feel like, I feel um, like we, I'm okay. missing a piece of history here. Here, here here's the thing. Puff was doing real dirt ball deals, which were industry standard by the people who taught him how to do dirt ball deals. And if you can get a better deal someplace else, why wouldn't you? Ask yourself a question. What label was Little Kim signed to? Wasn't Bad Boy. What label was Junior Mafia signed to? It wasn't Bad Boy. Go back and look. To quote Umar again, you don't find that suspicious? Wow. That's what it is. And when you start getting other people realizing what it is, even take that off the table. Go back and listen to Mace. I was murdered. P. Diddy made me pretty. I did it for the money. Now, can you get with me? Mm. Come on, man. I got clients who are former bad boy artists that ran from that label. Was it just the and bad contracts or him as a person on top? It was of the bad, bad contracts. It was the disrespect. It was the lack of communication. It was, I'll I'll play with you like a child plays with a toy on Christmas and then just wants to open up something else. Right? Like I said, give me a fuzz bubble record. Go ahead, sing one. Give me a Donnie Klang record. Sing it. Man. What about Dream? Can you, dream? Can you give me a Dream record? The Dream or... No, not the dream. I'm not talking about Terrius. Mm -mm. <laughs> no, you, you got nothing. Sherry Dennis. Give me a Sherry Dennis record. Sherry Dennis is one of the first artists in history to have a completely digital release. Mm. And she was dope. Had features with Jim Jones, everything. She was signed to Bad Boy. <laughs> Go on. Carl Thomas, shelved. Like I was saying on, on my live the other day, um, I was supposed to be doing uh, reference tracks and backgrounds for the shot, which was Dave Hollister, Carl Thomas, and Donnell Jones. The whole industry would have been shut down behind the shot. Like it, it would have been the biggest R&B supergroup in the history of R&B supergroups. You know who stopped that? Big Puff. Big. Wow. You're not going to eat if he got a say in it. Why do you think Mace kept hounding it? And so how did he get away with this for so long? And why is nobody, you still see artists from my generation embracing Puff. But with this bad history, why has nobody really said something? Pay attention. I'm going to say this again. Did, have you not seen what Clive Davis did? Um, no, what'd he do? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, he crafted an image of Whitney Houston that was completely counterculture of who she was. Um, look what he did to Luther Vandross. Barry White. You know who Barry White is? Yes. Okay. Barry White was like, yo, whatever you do, don't get with Clive. He told Luther Vandross that don't get with Clive. There's a reason. Do you know who Millie Vanilli is? I've heard that name. Millie Vanilli was a group that was put together, right? And because the real singers were fat and not necessarily attractive, this is, you know, a good 10, 15 years before Biggie, maybe. And my numbers could be off on the years, but it was definitely predates Bad Boy. They had a they had records, girl. You know it's true. They had all these records. They were signed to one of Clive's imprints. Clive knew that the pretty boys they put up front were lip syncing. He was in on it. But you know who was wound up holding the bag? The pretty boys who were lip syncing. And they were like, yo, we don't want to do this. Like, we can sing, we want to do our own thing. They said, if you say a word. We will tie you up in litigation. We will stalk your families. We will just stand up there. Like y'all think the y'all y'all are worried about criminals and gangs. The biggest gang you could ever deal with is the music industry. And they're all in it together. And the people who, who are calling the shots don't look like us. What did he do to Whitney Houston's image? Okay, well, he cleaned it up. He cleaned it up. He and I, I'm not talking bad about Whitney Houston. She's a wonderful lady. You know, um, he cleaned it up. She's from Jersey, but he made her into a pop princess. She want a pop princess. She's a hood chick. She's a hood chick. You ask anybody in Jersey, you know, who who knew the Houston's, they will tell you like, nah, they, 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 they some hood chicks. 
even Dion Warwick, who's a cousin, hood chicks, Sissy Houston. Yeah, okay, church. Every hood I know got churches with a Sissy Houston or Whitney Houston, the Dion Warwick in it. But you paint that image, and then after a while, you got to live up to that image. And then go back and listen to that last album when she's like, I look to you. And she can't hold the notes. Like, mm. and you're in a studio, you can't hold a note. But he was working her so hard. Some people that that instrument after a while will give out or it'll last forever, like Barbara Streisand. And like Clive Davis was essentially one of Diddy's mentors. The biggest. Wow. Right? You also have to look at the people that nobody's paying attention to. Nobody's paying attention to Lior. Who won the East Coast, West Coast beef? Young Dre? If I, if I have to speak for the young people, what they mm-hmm. might... I, you know what? I'm, I'm, I don't want to answer that. I, I wanna, I'd rather hear from you because... Jimmy Iovine won the East Coast, West Coast beef. At one point, he controlled Death Row. At one point, he, he controlled and distributed Bad Boy Records. He who has the gold makes the rules. He who makes the money makes the rules. And who is Jimmy Iovine, for those who may not, who don't really know who that is? Okay, Jimmy Iovine is the owner of Interscope Records. He made more money on that Beats by Dre deal than Dr. Dre did. What? Google if you got nothing better to do. I'm always here to be fact checked. Wow. Yeah. And how how'd that happen? Well, first I'll come back to that. But as far as Jimmy Iovine in the East Coast West Coast beef, how did he win that? Death Row Records was distributed by Interscope. Interscope is owned and run by Jimmy Iovine. Arista um, distributed Bad Boy for a while. Uh, Def Jam distributed Bad Boy for a while, but that catalog and that distribution, I still believe, is still through Interscope now. So during that beef, were record sales were getting boosted, or of course, that's the only reason was that record sales was getting boosted. T-shirts sales, merchandise was through the roof. Tours were through the roof. Um, magazine sales were through the roof. News programs talking about the East Coast, West Coast beef were through the roof. Hell, they did a Steve Harvey show after Biggie and Tupac died with Snoop Dogg and Puff Daddy because everybody, including the WWWB, was cashing in. Mm. Bro, it was an insane time. I remember when I was I was a sophomore in college, and people was like, "Yo, Pac got shot." I said again, because <laughs> he always gets shot. I was like, "Okay." Same thing. Big said to Tigger a couple of weeks before Big died. He said, "Yeah, you know." I was like, oh, "Got shot. He going heal up, make a couple records about it. And that's going to be what it is." You know, the other part of that is, full disclosure, at one point in my career, I actually worked with and for Feeney Shakur, who was Tupac's mother. Mm. And what people don't know is that Pac was a theater kid. Like, he, he wasn't no gangster. Ain't a whole lot of gangsters reading Shakespeare and, and thinking about um, soliloquies and the problems of the world today and, and all of those things. He played Bishop and kept moving in that space. He never broke out of that character. Even when he played Lucky and Poetic Justice, Lucky is more Bishop than he is Lucky. You see what I'm saying? Like, he understood that nobody wants a soft, sweet poet with the funny haircut and the soft mannerisms. So that's when he, you know, thug life and this, that, and the third, and ba da 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 And he tried to be an advocate in a, a, a New Age Black Panther way. And some of that worked and some of it didn't. But that whole situation, the East Coast, West Coast beef was orchestrated by people who did not look like us for the benefit of people who did not look like us from a financial standpoint. Mm. Not saying we didn't fuel the fire, but we didn't start it. No Billy Joel. 